that we are getting to talk to one of my favorite people in the whole world and probably one of my very first, um, I'm going to just say it, fitness famous people that I saw when I was a lowly group exercise instructor and she came in and brought all this energy and introduced me really to how amazing the fitness industry can be and why I'm still here today. Like, what, 17 years later or something insane? <laughs> Um, so this is Shannon Fable, and I'm going to let her tell you a little bit about herself. Okay. Thank you, Gretchen, for having me. I, so many people at Texas A&M that, um, that I've met through day on, and I love coming and inspiring, uh, you know, students that she is mentoring and seeing what you guys end up doing when you grow up. So thank you for having me here. I didn't mean that to be like, you've grown up, but oh my gosh, like you were just like a student learning how to teach step and high low. And now look at you. Um, my name is Shannon, like, like you said, and I have been in the industry for going on 25 years and in a variety of capacities. I too started out as a group fitness instructor almost by accident. And along the ways, different people that I met gave me different opportunities because they saw things in me that I didn't see in myself and said, I think you should try this thing. So um, I became a personal trainer as well, group fitness manager, being a group fitness manager led to my husband and I creating a software for group fitness management that we sold to a software company a couple of years ago. So that gave me software experience, business experience. Uh, Jay Blonick, who's one of my dear friends and mentors, uh, carried me along in several different capacities in program creation, working with Schwinn, creating cycling programs and workshops. Same thing for BOSU and, and many other opportunities along the way. And let's see, what else have I done? I, I switched my focus really about 12 years ago to the business development side in this industry, both with with um, companies like Schwinn and Bosu and Ace and Power Systems, but also for independents, whether they wanted to explore their career teaching or training in a facility to becoming presenters or writing or creating DVDs. And, you know, really have, have dug into that area, became a book yourself solid business coach outside of the fitness industry to bring that information back inside. And during the pandemic, I, I, I really realized I'd gotten far away from, from working with individuals and I needed to come back in because I do think this is the rise of the independent. And I don't say that as a, a, as in opposition to being in a gym, I just mean every fitness professional deserves the space and grace to navigate this career in a way that feels authentic for them and genuine for them. And, and I want to arm them with the tools to take back that control instead of doing what I call shape shifting and just saying yes to this opportunity or yes to that opportunity because other people have, or they think they should, or they're just happy to be here. So that's what I've been doing the last year or so. And yeah, just happy to be here. Thanks for having me. I love that you're speaking my language. I was the queen of yes to everything and it, it took experiential learning. So if we can shorten that experience for anyone, that would be wonderful. Someone sure. who's wanting to do something they're passionate about. But um, for those of you that have seen this before, you know that my whole platform right now is really focused on body positivity. And so if you're coming at this from a person who's maybe like, I don't want to be a fitness instructor. Why are we here today? Um, Stay tuned. This is for you too. But this episode is really, really geared toward mental health and fitness instructors and how body positivity greets all of that. Mm -hmm. Because sometimes I think we are so concerned about other people's mental health, and we'll get to that, that we kind of leave ourselves behind. And the words out of your mouth are speaking exactly one of the things that we need to touch on today. And that is um, this idea of saying yes to everything and trying to make yourself available. And um, I'm going to go ahead and talk about money because I think it's huge. Mm -hmm. um, making yourself not only available, but making yourself the cheapest so that people can um, want you just to be there, just mm -hmm. to be, whether it's being in front of the class or being employable. Um, but what does that in and of itself do to fitness instructors, mentally, physically, all of that? Oh my gosh. <laughs> How long do we have? Um, this is such a loaded topic. I'm going to approach it from a couple, couple of different places. I, I think people that come into the fitness industry, I, I don't believe it's like any other industry. Not many of us, you maybe, not many of us went to school and went, Ooh, 
I think I'll be a fitness instructor and get a degree to go teach. It's something we happen into. You know, my personal story was a dancer, cheerleader, was completely misplaced after college. And I stumbled into a step class and went, oh, this is my world. Like, this is my jam. I can do this. And then I saw that you could make money doing it. Or I think actually in my brain, it was, I could not have to pay for a gym membership if I did this thing. That makes sense to me at this point as a 20 something year old that was making $40,000 a year. It made sense to get rid of that expense by doing a job, right? And it was fun. So it didn't feel much like work. And because most of us get into it in that way, I don't know that we ever, we don't ever look at it from the same vantage point as I did as a sociologist going to get a job, right? So that's step number one is, is just because you got into it because you enjoyed it doesn't mean that you should or can do it for free because everything has a cost. It costs you time and energy to learn how to do this thing that you love. It costs a lot of time and energy, time away from your family, time away from other things that you might desire. You're taking something that is a hobby, a passion, something that's fun for you and turning it into work. Even if it doesn't feel like work, it's still a very different feeling, right? Once you become an instructor. So I don't know, somewhere in the beginning, we have to uncouple those two things. Once you are getting paid to do it and someone is telling you when to show up and do it, it is a job and you need to look at it as something that is that commands a dollar amount because you've heard me say a million times, even a mission needs a margin. Like even if I work for a nonprofit, I have to make money to still do the very philanthropic thing that I want to do. So I don't care if you say I do it, even if no one paid me, you have to. Now, the second thing, I think once you get up on that stage, you get bit by the bug. Do you not? Yeah. I was a frustrated rock star. I'm so glad you decided to go there. <laughs> I mean, you get bit by the bug because you're like, you start to justify, okay, well, I'm not making that much money, but did you have these like mental gymnastics yourself? Like I'm not getting paid a lot to do it, but I'm also not having to pay for my gym membership anymore. So that kind of works out. Oh, and then there's also this, I get to stand up in front of a bunch of people and they follow me and they have to, and they like me and they tell me I do a good job. Like I call it getting paid in ego strokes. So you start to like weigh this balance of like, okay, I'm not making a lot, but the gym membership is paid for and I get paid in ego strokes every time I show up and win someone over. And so this becomes your currency. The other problem is your currency is numbers because what's your group fitness manager talking to you about? What are you comparing yourself to other instructors with? It's always around numbers, not by impact. Because how do we measure the impact of what we do long-term? Like there's no other currency except numbers. Right. So that does a real, that does a job on your brain. Um, and you start to do, like you said, you start to say yes to things because you want more of that drug. I want more of the ego strokes. So I want more classes. I want more opportunities to teach. I want better time slots. I want more people in my classes. <laughs> and it goes on and on and on. And, and that can, you know, when I think the, the first thing mental health wise with instructors is at some point you will, I hope everyone will have this moment in their career where that becomes separated, where it becomes very evident to you that you are working for the ego struck part of it. And you've kind of lost a sense of the why, or you really, you really don't necessarily, you need to find your why back into, you know, what you're doing this for, what is the bigger thing that exists outside of yourself for teaching. So I'm going to stop there. I have so many things I want to say. And I don't say any of that in a bad way, because you have to have an ego to want to stand up in front of people with a microphone on and tell them what to do in spandex. Like you have to have a, you have to be a little bit of a performer. Um, and, you know, I, I think we've heard the stories about performers during the pandemic and how they're really suffering mm -hmm. mentally. And it's not that their wallets like, oh, poor thing, you're not making millions of dollars touring, but it's really, they're not getting the thing back that fed them, that kept them doing more, getting better, you know, being creative. So it, it's a really interesting, interesting thing to unpack and think about. I, I mean, as a fitness professional turned life coach, still professional, fitness professional, like this is, this is my language. I absolutely love it. And um, I would challenge anybody that's listening. If you're, if you're thinking, well, that's not really me. I'm doing 
do what she's saying, like figure out what, how, what makes you stay there? What makes you stay where you are? Get out a pen and paper and write it mm -hmm. down. I mean, it took me until my, I literally, Shannon, I just quit my last little gym hanger on her. And I mean, I would like, why was I even holding on to it? And that's mm -hmm. what I had to do. I'm like, why am I doing this? First thing, oh, my gym membership. Okay, be honest with yourself. When was the last time you had the time to go to the gym? You've been working out at home for over a year and you figured it out. So I had to make that list for myself. Like, what is it? Well, there is this component to live fitness and being in front of the group. I'm an extrovert. I'm in, I feed off of the energy of other people mm -hmm. and I do love it. But what it was costing me was way more. It was costing me way more. And it is, it's just, if you treat it like a currency, it becomes really obvious if it's still worth it. Mm -hmm. or, yeah. Yeah. And I was say, and it's okay. I, it's okay to realize that you're doing it as a job and expect the currency to actually be financial. Right. Yes. There's, that yeah. doesn't make you a bad person. And I think that's the second piece of the mental health issue with group fitness instructors is um, Petra Kolber says this to me all the time. She's like, you know, she, she and I work together on business stuff now. And she's like, I always respected that you treated this as a business and you got shunned and kind of voted off the island a few times for speaking up about that, that like, no, I'm not going to do that because it's good exposure or no, I'm not going to do that for that amount of money because it costs me more to do that. And there's nothing that I can gain from it. There is nothing wrong with it. If you have, to, now I love how many people can do this as a part-time gig because they enjoy it and they don't need to do it for financial reasons. I appreciate that. It still doesn't make it your hobby. And when you call it your hobby, it devalues it for those of us that do do it as a profession. So call a spade a spade. Like you are very fortunate that you don't have to make money from it. Right. You're very fortunate. And there are lots of people that do lots of jobs, not because they have to, like they've got plenty of money in the bank and they're living on their, you know, their earnings from past, but they don't devalue what they do. Now they might go work for a nonprofit or take a, a lesser paid position in a different organization, but long short, it, I did have to go through a lot of tough times in this industry by people just kind of turning their nose up at me that I would say no to things because it didn't fit with my financial needs. And it's not that I was just doing it for the money, but it was my career. And so, no, I can't teach for $14 an hour because by the time I add up how much time it took me to think about it, do it, the experience I bring to the table, the music, the outfit, the driving, the childcare, showing up 15 minutes early, doing the thing, staying 15 minutes after to talk to everyone and the stress that it causes you internally, which we're all learning a little bit more. Let's talk about health. Um, there's some, and that is mental health, right? The stress element of it. We don't look at it as stress because we do it every single day, but that is like on a balance sheet. You're talking about a balance sheet, Gretchen, like $14 and all that, that I just talked about, like it, it doesn't work out. So, you know, just don't be, don't be afraid to admit that this is your career and you need to make smart choices for your family and for yourself financially, emotionally physically and everything. None of us should have to teach 17 classes a week to make $40,000 a year. Yes. Nor should we be expected to, or, I mean, I think the takeaway is not, Hey, everybody quit the gym and go do your own thing. The takeaway no. is, Hey, let's as a community start standing up for the mental health of our entire community. And knowing that, you know, the stress that's put on us by trying to make ends meet because they're paying us in, like you said, ego strokes is, is hard. And I, I do know that too, this idea of having the hobby people and then the full-time people, a lot of gyms are like, well, then you should go into a real job. You should come and work the sales desk. Like, but that's not what I love. Right? They're <laughs> like, not the same thing. You're in a hobby job, a hobby job. Like that's not a thing. That's not mm -hmm. a thing. A job is a job is a job. And the fact that you use hobby job just means, well, this is a job that you like. You shouldn't really like your job. So talk about mental health. We have a job that we like, and then we're guilted into feeling like we have to take beans for that job because we enjoy it. And so that's a whole thing that'll really, really mess with your head. Um, and it also really allows us to be elitist in a lot of ways. 
um, because you're chasing people that have a lot of extra time on their hands typically, um, mm -hmm. at least in, in my experience. And you can, you can share yours, but in my experience, it's been, well, this person can teach the 17 class and agrees to, and so let's give them what give them the things and I'm stuck over here going well okay I just like I'm again like you said fighting for the money that you need and letting this tear grow mm -hmm. ahead of me and all of a sudden you're like not as experienced or not as college degree um experience be damned like you are you're still down here um right. but you're not willing to suffer through that and that trend continues all the way to the top Mm -hmm. All the way to the top. It tr it continues. It continues because we refuse. Oh gosh, now you've got me going off on a tangent. This was not the. I, but I'm like, we refuse to talk about money a lot of times. Mm -hmm. I I remember I did. I was doing a virtual conference. I did a presentation, and I was just finally like, look, guys, I'm going to talk about money for a second. Mm -hmm. And everyone got excited mm -hmm. because it's the people that have made those compromises that aren't talking about it because that's a whole lot to unpack. Mm -hmm. To realize that you got to where you are and your ego is the only thing carrying you through and it's not filling up your pockets. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and I think, gosh, again, so much to unpack. Right. I don't, I don't want people listening to think that you can't do something for no money. And it doesn't make you a bad person if you did. I think sometimes it's just that we don't stop to do the work that you said you did, which is literally write it down on a sheet of paper. And I mean, I've done plenty of things for free. If I know there is something that I can gain from it. So what do I mean by that? Showing up at a conference to teach for free makes sense to me if the market and even me sponsoring myself to show up at a conference and pay to be there makes sense to me if I will be exposed to my target market I have the opportunity to sell myself to those people and follow up with them and see if there's something else I can do for them. So the money may not come in the form of being paid to show up at the event, but I know over time I'll be able to monetize it. And that doesn't necessarily happen right now at all conferences. So, so that's why sometimes people are like, well, you know, you're, you're really, you say that, but then you do show up and do things for free. I'm like, yes. And if yeah. I can't do that, if I'm told you cannot promote yourself, you do not get the list, you cannot send them emails, you can't tell them about what you do, you can't put your website on your outline, you can't know, then I am, I am your product, then that means you need to pay me. But if you want me to be your product without paying me, then I need to be able to, I can't just keep showing up at all these events just because you want a good business docket, right? So there, you know, I want to make sure that people hear both sides of it. There are reasons to do things for free. If it is a marketing thing that you have a way where you can end up getting some kind of return on your emotional investment that is beyond the ego. Mm -hmm. There are some times where you need to say yes to things because it is good for your career. But what I hope will change in our industry is people not just saying that over and over and making people that maybe don't need the exposure anymore that either need the return on the investment or the payment because they've gotten to that place in their career that we also aren't meant to feel bad about saying no yeah. right so so many things we could say yeah, and, and, and i think our industry has to change and and i was hoping that during the pandemic after the pandemic that gyms and i think gyms are i think gyms are wiser to instructors and trainers were their product yeah. And they need to be compensated in alignment with that. And, and I do feel for gyms because it is changing their entire, it is a paradigm shift and it is a business model shift. And that is hard to do mm -hmm. after 15 months of being closed. So I hope that we can give them space and grace and not just come back in with our, you know, we are an army and we expect to be paid more and holding them hostage because that's not going to work either. But how can we all be creative and say, okay, I'm willing to give this to you but this is what I need. I can't, my body, my brain, my head, my heart can't take teaching 17 classes a week, but then you've either got to let me do stuff on the side by myself and not look at that as my competition and not fight me on it. Or you need to find other ways to put together employment inside of your facility that allows me, and you can't just say, well, just coach, don't ride the bike the whole time. Right. It doesn't work that way. <laughs> um, so 
lots of things that, that have to happen. In the room, like there are certain things, and typically you're hearing that from management that isn't, which is a whole. We can't go there too. We've already gone so far off the rails. But management that isn't an instructor, uh-huh. or I mean, have you ever been evaluated by someone that has zero group fitness experience? <laughs> It happens. It really does yeah. happen. So, um, yeah. Totally. Totally. I'll let you get us back on, on track. No, Sorry. I, I, <laughs> you know, so this is, this is beautiful though. I love it. And I always think like, um, when I'm, when I'm putting feelers out or I'm asking people, I'm like, you know, we're going to talk about the right thing. Cause I'm like, this is where my mind's at right now. And this is where your mind's at right now. It might not line up with my notes. That's okay. I think it's something <laughs> that needs to be heard. This, this really, really does. And Um, And remember too, if you are, if you're listening to this as a very new instructor, this is a journey. She's far ahead of me. I'm still like branching out in the first. So I'm in that phase you were talking about. Yeah. Sometimes I'll pay to be at the conference because that allows me to give them my website, to collect emails, to um, offer a prize, to get an email list and offer them a freemium and try to get them subscribed. You know, there's all these little bitty things that you can look into. And there's a lot of people out there that teach this. Um, So it might be levels ahead, right? Like you said, we're not gonna walk in tomorrow and say, I expect all of this and benefits and then never go to a conference because it's a journey. But um, another thing, so I wanna talk about this. This is kind of, we're gonna jump for a second. I want to talk a little bit about body image and group Mm. fitness because this is a huge thing. And thankfully, again, I think it has a lot to do with the pandemic. We're starting to see people um, show up who aren't in that kind of traditional group fitness instructor body type. Mm -hmm. Um, And we're getting this idea of, oh, this is healthy. But I think a lot of fitness instructors, um, they'll maybe they'll talk about oh you only need 30 minutes a day and you only you can eat whatever you want but on the back side of that they're like really hurting and struggling mentally Mm -hmm. and physically because they're trying to be the person in the front of the room not only that talks the best but is also the most fit or the most um like the aesthetics are so very Mm -hmm. pleasing to the rest of the class uh have you ever dealt with like yourself or other instructors that have struggled in this capacity Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. Uh, it, like, I feel like crying part of it is me being on vacation for five days and feeling really worn down. But the other part is it's like, as you were talking, I'm like, Oh my God, I, I am the healthiest I've ever been in my entire career as an, as a fitness professional. And mind you, I haven't been in the like teaching being paid to teach fitness classes whether that's presenting at conferences, teaching in front of a classroom, training, uh, filming DVDs in, I'm going to go maybe six or seven years. So I really thought that my mental health around body image would shift when I was no longer donning spandex in public. (laughs) And I thought that it had. I could trick myself into believing that it had. But I was still in an industry where, like you said, aesthetics is the name of the game. And if, even if people say it isn't, it silently is. And there is a comparison game, both with people inside the industry and those that take from us. And you know why I say I'm like almost on the verge of tears. Like I I look back in the last 15 months and the only reason why I am, like I've been priding myself, like I feel mentally stronger because, you know, I've been able to do things for me and da, da, da. And I just realized as you were talking, I'm like, the reason why I feel better is because I'm not in that environment anymore. And that is a really sad realization because I'm almost, and I don't know if you, for many reasons, I almost feel panicked for the doctor's excuse to go away. Mm. What do I mean by that? I feel a little bit panicked about in two weeks, I have to go to a live fitness event. Yeah. That that's all going to start to come back. Yes. And me being around people that this is their job on a daily is that can I, I want to say a bad word, like that can screw with your brain. And it does, even if you don't put a name to it. And I think it's almost worse because we don't put a name to it. Because again, like I said, like feeling like you're a bad person because you want money and then you do all these mental gymnastics around it. I do all this mental gymnastics around body image too, because I know I'm not supposed to care and it's not supposed to matter, but it does. 
And then I hate myself because it does. And then I go into this really dark place. So I, I have spent the last year really working on this self for, for me. And I've spent a lot of time on podcast and being interviewed, talking about it. Um, the biggest work I've done is learning to truly uncouple exercise from eating. Um, and I didn't realize how screwed up that was. I, I mean, there's so much to talk about here. There's the comparison game. There's feeling like you've got to be, you know, you've got to look the part to play the part. And it's like, what is the part that we're playing? I, I'm a fitness instructor. I can know how to teach a solid step class, dance class, Zumba class, cycling class without having a six pack. Like a six pack doesn't make me a great instructor. Um, my brain what makes me a really good instructor. Right. And if people could see themselves up there, like why do we have to look better than everyone in the room? Right. I know we say that. And then, like I said, it's like that mental gymnastics where we say that, but then we put the words back in our mouths because we know that people want that. But then some of them, everyone has their own reality, right? Some people do need the thing to aspire to. That is motivation for them. Some people do want to see themselves in the person there because it makes them feel better. But when you, you said it right, like the pandemic has made this such a bigger conversation because for the first time in forever, you haven't had to make all 50 people in front of you like you. The people that wanted what you had to sell came to you. So you could sit behind your, um, your screen and you could be true to who you are. Mm -hmm. And if I need someone to aspire to be, I would go find that for my product. Where if I want to see myself in them, I would go find that product versus we go back to the numbers thing and the ego stroke thing. When you're teaching hundred people a kickboxing class on Monday night, you have to be all those things to all those people. I simultaneously have to not care because Stella in the back wants to see themselves in me and doesn't want me to, to be too fit or too perfect. I need to be perfect for the seven front row frowners that I have that want my job. I need to be somewhere in the middle for the people in the middle row. Oh, and then I've got to teach to all of them too, because they've all got different learning styles. Like you tell me that I'm going to go back to the money thing for a minute. You tell me that that's only worth $14 an hour. Right. And then I can say, well, I don't really care. I'm just going to do me, but you do really care because then they're not going to say they like you. If you get the idea. So I, I do believe that this, the pandemic has afforded us the luxury to put ourselves in this little China cabinet and let people come to the China cabinet that want to see what's inside the China cabinet. And my fear is that when we go back into the real world, can we, or my concern, my hope, I guess maybe is better, is that we can carry that back into the real world where we feel okay knowing that we can inspire a bunch of people just by being real. Um, and we can accept that, you know, body positivity isn't about people not wanting, not, not wanting to make changes or be better or be more fit or, you know, lower their cholesterol or maybe even drop a couple of pounds. Like it just means accepting yourself for who you are right now and doing what makes you feel good. I, there's so much more around that too, but yeah, I don't know what's gonna happen when um, when the training wheels come back off post pandemic. Cause it has been lovely to see people embracing this body positivity, but are we embracing it because we can't actually see the whole person um, and we can ignore the naysayers and we can not listen to the haters online where it's, it's a different story when they're in your face in front of you with a scowl. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, I think it's so funny. You talked about that kind of fear of going back in front of people. That happened to me like literally last week. I had like a conference and I was meeting with some people, not the presenting kind of conference. I went to one and there was a small group of us and here I am like pandemic and just realizing most of them have only seen me from here up. So what do I start freaking out about? Well, I had a baby 16 months ago. So I'm like, oh my gosh, my belly, my belly, my belt. And just all of a sudden I'm sitting here thinking, oh my gosh, I'm billing myself as the body positive fit coach, but it's still impactful. It doesn't matter. I mean, mm -hmm. part of the reason I embrace this is because this is my journey. This is what I'm unpacking on a daily basis is who am I today and how can I be the best and in my, for me, the healthiest version. And I also love that you said you don't have to just say, oh, I'm here. This is me. I'm uncomfortable in my skin. I'm overweight, but I have to love it. Like that's not what body positivity about is about it's not body love sometimes it's just body neutrality like forget mm -hmm. about that body and let's let's go to health let's go mm -hmm. and and you will you'll find those people coming to you to make a difference so 
it's going to be interesting. That's for sure. It's for and but I, I just really hope that as fitness professionals we can start talking about it because I think that's first thing like we can have these conversations like you and I are having that's like yeah mm -hmm. that was a struggle for me to show up totally I, I you know and if people come and they're even admitting to the point of like oh I went on this crazy exercise binge right before this conference because I freaked out like can we just mm -hmm. talk about it destigmatize it have a conversation um yeah, I think that's, it's huge. It's, mm -hmm. it's a whole thing. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And, th you know, I would say just, I hope anyone that's listening, I worry most about our mental health because I, I'm not sure if everyone is thinking that much about how different it is going to be when you go back into the real world. And it really is the real world. And, you know, I had this happen to me 12 years ago, you know, my birth story or my, my path to becoming a mom. And, the same thing happened. Like I was on a journey for many years trying to become pregnant. Lots of drugs, lots of shots. Lots of people telling me it's about how I ate. Like I, w I was actually stigmatized for the opposite of body image. Like you care too much. You exercise too much. This is why you can't get pregnant. Like, I mean, let's leave that over there. Cause I've been through lots of therapy about that. Oh. Um, but then I had a doctor's note. It didn't last for 15 months, like the pandemic, but I was in the hospital for 73 days where again, I had this moment about two weeks into it, you know, the first two weeks I freaked out because I'm like, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God, I still need to exercise. I need to do this. And then finally, when no one's visiting, no one sees me, I have a mirror, I'm pregnant. My job is just to keep this baby alive, right? <laughs> um, I stopped caring and it felt so good, but it was denial. It was like, I was in this safe little cocoon, this little bubble where to your point, like people only saw me from here up and I was pregnant. So I got a pass, right? Yeah, right. And then, <laughs> As the days, as we started counting down and I realized I was going to have her and I was going to have to go back out into the real world, to your point, oh my God, in those moments where all I should have been concerned about was being a new mom and birthing a two pound baby that then needed to live in an incubator, like my brain went to a different place and it wasn't about getting back to work. It wasn't about like, that wasn't it. And that's what people thought. That's a whole other conversation, but it was about, oh my God, I am going to get back to work. And I have been laying down for 73 days and I haven't exercised in two and a half months. And before that it was very low. Like I haven't done anything. Oh my God, look at me. Is anyone going to take me seriously? Right. And for how long am I going to have to have an excuse? And, and like, I'm kind of, and I hate to use the word PTSD. I don't mean it in any kind of light, but I'm having those flashbacks right now. And I'm worried about people that maybe, like I started protecting myself against it <laughs> six months ago because I remember how it felt re-emerging. And I could see all the similarities in my brain where like even you and I talked before I came on, I just went on my first vacation in 14 months and there was some panic right before vacation because I was like, oh my God, I don't get my waffle in the morning and I'm not gonna have control over my food. Like I felt like I, I had become so evolved in the last year with my whole, like taking care of myself. And then I realized like maybe I've swung the pendulum a little too far to the other side where now I'm kind of scared to go back to a real world situation where I'm at Disney World. What? I'm not eating grilled chicken. Like, it, <laughs> no, I'm eating churros and pretzels and drinking right. around the world at Epcot. Like, and like, I had to really have this moment with myself of, okay, I've got to, I've got to learn how to live somewhere in the middle of all these extremes. And that is a forever thing. And, and you know, this whole thing about mental health is what we're talking about today for, for fitness folks, just having the conversations about it and knowing that probably every single person that you've ever met, whatever level of the fitness industry they're at, wherever they are on their journey and their career, it is going through their head too, even if they act like it's not. We all have an ish around it. And my biggest, my biggest thing for fitness professionals is admit to the ish, <laughs> talk about the ish, because the last thing you want is your ish to come out on your microphone. I'm like, she knows where I'm going next. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, it, it, that's that my next thing I was going to say is, so, you know, we have these little things going on, um, and they might be exponentially greater in the people that walked into the gym for the first time. So there are things that we have a responsibility to address and avoid. And what we say is a huge part of that. I cannot, and I, I have done it. I'll be honest. Like we've all said the wrong thing. If you've talked in a mic ever, something weird comes out at some point, but 
if I hear in a class someone talking about earning, you talk about food and exercise. If it ever comes out of your mouth that you are even talking about food in a class, almost you shouldn't, unless you're like doing those things on the bike, right? Like this side likes ice cream, this side likes cake. That's fine, whatever. But to even say, oh, I can't wait to go have a margarita because I just did all this stuff. Or if you go this low in your squats, remember you're earning X, Y, Z, like that kind of stuff. And to talk about, and we can talk forever about why this is horribly wrong, but to look at your own watch and talk about how many calories you burn. Like, mm-hmm. first of all, I, so I did, this is, you know, just my wrist is blank. I've had like Apple Watch forever. And so I'm taking a little break from it for that exact reason. I was, I was using those numbers and they were becoming my, my food currency. Mm-hmm. And so I've had to take a break from that. And so we don't want to invite people into our own issues. Exactly what you said. Yeah. I want to start with the metrics and, you know, I referenced Jay earlier. I, I was having a conversation with him about it and he's like, but you know, you can change the numbers on your watch daily. Right. And I'm like, Oh yeah. So the watch isn't the enemy. Our relationship with the watch is the enemy. Right. And, um, and, and I think that's really important. I wrote a blog about it because I was going through the same thing and, uh, I've done work with stronger you a couple times and I appreciate their nutrition advice. And my first coach, or same coach, first time that I was with this coach, she's like, my only thing, like, I know you're here to like lose X, Y, Z pounds, et cetera. But my thing with you is I need to get you to not associate exercise with your weight loss, right? So if your macros are off one day, you can't out exercise it. So I don't even care about you tracking your macros for this first month with me. What I wanna see is that two days a week, you don't hit the numbers on your Apple watch. That's your goal. And I was like, what do you mean? To your point, but if I don't hit that, then I'm gonna gain weight because that's my homeostasis. I do this much working out and I get to eat this much food. Mm-hmm. And if this number doesn't say that, that she's like, I need you to prove to yourself that that's not actually true. Like you've got to see the data. Now, the first time I went through stronger, you, I was that person. And I'll talk about my friend, Eliza later. Um, I wouldn't weigh myself for a variety of reasons. I'm not going to take you all the way back to college, but I got weighed in all the time. And so I had a very unhealthy relationship with the scale, especially being the second biggest girl in the squad almost every year that I cheered. And I think I weighed 109 pounds. I was about to say, Um, I I know you, I've seen you in person. How in the world, (laughs) how in the world were you? (laughs) Yeah. So just go there. Like imagine living your life. And, you know, as a, a cheerleader at a D1 school, seven girls, seven guys, you live together, travel together, practice together. You're always together. People always analyzing your food, analyzing your exercise, analyzing how, oh my God, you feel really heavy today. Like, Okay. Imagine, right. So I had a very unhealthy relationship with the scale. And so I wouldn't weigh myself and my coach at stronger. You was like, okay, well, this is new. Um, I'm not sure what to do with you. If you're not going to look at the scale and you're not going to take pictures. I'm like, I know. And that's why she did this for me. She's like, okay, fine. We're going to take a different approach. And and I applaud her. She's like, all right, well, you're the client. And if you're telling me that is going to freak you out and that's not what you want to do, then I'm going to trust that we can set other goals. And this was her goal. Now, the funny thing about it, my friend, Eliza, who um, she wrote the book, Brain Powered Weight Loss. She is such a smart woman that uses neuropsychology and quantum physics to teach you what your problem is with your weight and your body image. It's phenomenal. But she was the one that always told me, she's like, yeah, you know, you, you, you kind of pride yourself on like not using the scale, but she's like, avoidance is not the same thing as having a healthier relationship with the data. And I was like, Oh, that was really affronting. Um, and so I had to think about that. So I joined her program. She does this amazing program called the shift. It's a 10 week program to get you unstuck. That's the best way I can explain it. And it works with everything, whether it is weight loss, um, money, relationships. And, you know, she and I talked about what am I trying to get out of? Because I don't need to lose, I don't need to lose weight, but I really wanted to change my relationship with the metrics, my relationship with exercise, the coupling of exercise and eating. And so she took it a step further than my stronger you coach. And, and And I truly will say it was the first time in my life where I realized that these two things just don't, they have nothing to do with each other. So I layered back in weighing myself. I had to get okay with that. 
But what I was now able to do, like step one with my stronger you coach was not work out a couple of days a week and be okay with that. But I still didn't have data to back up that I was okay. I just had to trust that I was okay. Right. That's still flying without a net. So now I've layered back in weight, you know, tracking my weight every day, but not having a reaction to the number, just knowing it's data. And then what I was able to see is I do allow myself two days during the week where I do not hit my number goal at all the scale doesn't change. It literally doesn't change. I'm like, oh my God, how many years have I been doing this all for the wrong reasons? And we go back to like the power of that. What makes me so sad when I think about it is because it was so inextricably linked, the metrics, the weight, the food, the exercise minutes, how many minutes am I standing up? Like it was all jumbled in my brain. My cueing came from that place. Even if I was trying to smooth out my words, um, it was still the impetus to everything that I programmed in a class and how hard I was working in class was about what I ate the day before or what I was going to eat the next day or there, there, and, and that's not fair. Like, and that's the other part, going back to this whole hobby thing. Like I always told my instructors teaching, you are not teaching for your workout. And I know you guys have heard that conversation so often, but you are a lot of times. You are. And, and it's just, I mean, it's so tough with the mental health piece of it. Like it's so jacked up in your brain, what is going on. And then you've got a microphone on. That's why I say like, you've got to be all right with your ish and you've got to work on your stuff because it may, it does inadvertently come out. Even if you think you're a super evolved human being, like it comes out of your mouth. I knew everything that I was doing back here and there was no way to completely filter it and come across as neutral. Your job in the front of a classroom is to lead safe and effective exercise. Safe and effective exercise. Yes, you need to be hydrated. And yes, you need to fuel yourself to, to work out and be okay. But for the exercise that we're doing, like this is not rocket science, <laughs> right? And it just needs to be about the joy of freaking moving. We just need people to fall in love with moving their bodies so they'll do it forever. Because you know, I remember, and I worry about this during the pandemic too, like you get past this point of, forget it, I give up. So I'm not going to exercise at all because it's not working. And it's like, well, what's not working? Because moving your body is its own thing. Like you, I just, you get it. I could go on forever. It just, um, I love that. It's tough. Yeah. And when I, so I do two, I have private clients, which again, those are kind of one-on-one, -on -one, but whenever I have my group, that's the whole entire, you know, I'm based on behavior change, preparation, action, maintenance. The whole preparation phase is always about uncoupling things changing language um and if they don't nail that part because there are there are people who come through and no matter what i say they report back to me every day they met their goal and i'm like that's great that's great like i am i'm proud of you that's wonderful but the we always follow up with a why or they tell me their weight like you're saying their weight okay awesome how is your relationship with gravity that day like that's what we're measuring right so there's all these whys and that's a good place to start, I think, for anybody, especially if you're saying like, oh, I don't have these issues. That's not me. When you do these little things, ask yourself why and be really honest. If you won't quit a gym, ask yourself why. Because just teaching at a gym means I have a way to burn some extra calories. Mm -hmm. How have I actually taught at that gym since like last August? No, I haven't. But, you know, that was just part of my, and it's a journey. It's a way to I don't know. You have, you have places you can go. You can, you're never going to get over it completely. I hate to even say that because mm -hmm. it's like, you don't have a win, but if you start catching yourself and you start asking why it is phenomenal, how much better you really feel. And that better, at least in my experience has nothing to do with what's happening physically. The mm -hmm. better is like, it's like a total body sigh of relief. When you nail that, like, oh, here's what I'm actually doing. And like you said, that jumble was a beautiful imagery to me. Um, it is. It's just rattling and rattling. And whatever pops to the surface is the thing that you're thinking of. So stopping and figuring it out, smoothing it out, eliminating what needs to be eliminated, adding in what needs to be added in with the help of someone else, please. That's so much better. Then mm -hmm. it's like, for me, it was like a big sigh of relief and it, yeah. it took me getting my own. I got a coach and I figured my stuff out 
Well, and I think what you're saying is really important. It, it, this is the crux of it. My friend Eliza who teaches about it because she comes from a neuropsychology standpoint and you're like, wait, what? And her whole thing is you have to change your vibration. Like you can't keep bringing your same self to the same problem, expect a different result. So if you approach weight loss or a fitness goal or a relationship goal or a money goal from a place of bad vibration, and I know that sounds so juju, just go with me, then there is always resistance to it. And, and there is physical evidence this is true. And she talks about this experiment with crystals and water where mm -hmm. there were just, did it, yeah, the positive words on, on the bottles and the crystals grew towards the positive words and did not grow when there were negative words. Like there is real science and evidence around how you're feeling tight. So what I started realizing through working with her is like all this jumbled mess was actually holding on to the, the weight that I felt I needed to lose. It was holding on to the limits in my physical abilities in my workouts, whether it was my bike riding or my running. It was holding on to my relationship. And when I finally got, and I'm not through with her work, I hate to say that because the work is never done, like you said, but when I finally got it, like literally the weight that I've been wanting to lose and that we, and you know, don't judge me for saying I wanted to lose weight. Like for me, I, there were like three or five pounds that I was holding on to for a good 10 years that like, I just needed to be done with. But when I changed my vibration around why and around the what and around the how it yeah. happened, like it was like magical. Um. Oh, magical. And I do say it is a work in progress because I did, you know, I let myself go and I let myself enjoy my vacation. And you should be able to do that too, right? Everything in moderation, even moderation. And like I try to teach my kid because you have two girls. It's a whole different world when you are seeing things and my daughter is going through puberty and that whole thing and her body is changing. And I watch myself very, very close and I don't do it perfectly. Like there are so many things I wanted to shove back in my mouth. But I had to realize, like, especially these five days while you know, we're together on vacation, I can't be counting my macros while I'm on vacation. I can make smart choices, but like I teach her, I'm like, sometimes we eat for health reasons and sometimes we eat for enjoyment. Yeah. And on Sunday at Epcot, I ate for enjoyment around the world. <laughs> Did I like the way I felt the next day? No. But I ate for enjoyment and made me very happy in the moment. And it isn't going to change anything. Now I know what I have to do mentally. What I had to train myself not to do today was, okay, I'm not going to wake up and kill myself in a workout. I'm not going to starve myself today because I ate that way yesterday. And I also didn't like kill myself to try to work out every day that I was on vacation. Like it's all, it's all work in progress, but it, like you said, it's me learning how to unjumble it in my brain. So it's very clear food and exercise are not stuck together. One day of bad eating does not make me a bad person. It just does not change my worth as a person. And it's all going to be okay. I, I mean, I know it sounds so easy to say, but I, so much of our mental headspace is wasted on trying to figure it all out when at the end of the day, when you do the sigh you were talking about, you know, like Eliza says, change your vibration to it all. It just becomes so much easier. You're, you're swimming downstream instead of upstream, which is a lovely feeling all of a sudden. All of a sudden. And um and it really is all about quantum physics. Like I've I've read the studies, I've heard it's crazy, and I know there's someone's like, y'all know what you're talking about. It it really is. Like it it's when you dive deep, and for me it wasn't until my master's level of coaching that I training that we talked about it. So it's not for like introduction to how your body deals with stuff, but it's super, super fascinating. If you are like a research person, if you're a um, person that just likes to learn, we can talk Super about cool. That. Yeah. <laughs> yeah really, really cool. Um, but yeah, I, we have, we have taken so many different dives and I think we have like, there's still so much more we could talk about, but I kind of, the take home to me is like, you don't have to be perfect. None of us are. And, but you do have to deal with what's going on. And maybe a side note is stand up for your worth. <laughs> like, <laughs> for sure how, how do we sum up all this stuff like that's kind of yeah. the sentence that does it <laughs> yeah and I would say I sum it up by saying be authentic and be real the real the world needs a lot more real right now and instead of justifying your behavior whether that is well, I feel like I should do it for free because I get a gym membership and I da 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 or I feel like I need to work out and look this way because they do and da 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 like 
stop justifying it, be authentic, be real. If we could, I, you know, you even use the word stigma, like we could destigmatize this by just being honest and real and having the conversations instead of comparing highlight reels. Wouldn't that be amazing? Like, I, you know, I, I want to live in a world where like, we're, we're not watching people's Instagram feeds to see, well, do they still look the way that they did 12 months ago? Do I look the same as I did 12 months ago? What's going to happen when we get back together with each Like, who cares? We should just be super excited to be back together with people. But yeah, I, I love that in the last 15 months, people have gotten really real and opened up the conversation. You know, I think the digital world, being able to hide behind a screen a little bit has allowed folks to be a bit more vulnerable. And mm -hmm. I hope we will carry that vulnerability back to IRL um, yep. because that's what we all need. Yes. Oh, perfect. Perfect. Well, thank you so, so very much. I'm sure there are so many people that are going to be very highly impacted by everything you had to say because there always are. It's always amazing to hear you. Um, and thank you for talking with me today. That was really special. Thank you. I appreciate it.